Steve Grand, he's the one on the left, Douglas Adams is on the right. Steve Grand, in his book Creation, Life and How to Make It, is positively scathing about our preoccupation with matter itself. We have this tendency to think that only solid, material things are really things at all. Waves of electromagnetic fluctuation in a vacuum seem unreal. Victorians thought the waves had to be waves in some material medium, the ether. But we find real matter comforting only because we've evolved to survive in middle world where matter is a useful fiction. A whirlpool for Steve Grand is a thing with just as much reality as a rock. In a desert plain in Tanzania, in the shadow of the volcano Ordonio Lengai, there's a dune made of volcanic ash. The beautiful thing is that it moves bodily. It's what's technically known as a barkan, and the entire dune walks across the desert in a westerly direction at a speed of about 17 meters per year. It retains its crescent shape and moves in the direction of the horns. What happens is that the wind blows the sand up the shallow slope on the other side, and then as each sand grain hits the top of the ridge, it cascades down on the inside of the crescent, and so the whole horn-shaped dune moves. Steve Graham points out that you and I are ourselves more like a wave than a permanent thing. He invites us, the reader, to think of an experience from your childhood, something you remember clearly, something you can see, feel, maybe even smell, as if you were really there. After all, you really were there at the time, weren't you? How else would you remember it? But here is the bombshell. You weren't there. Not a single atom that is in your body today was there when that event took place. Matter flows from place to place and momentarily comes together to be you. Whatever you are, therefore, you are not the stuff of which you are made. If that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, read it again until it does, because it is important. So it really isn't a word that we should use with simple confidence. If a neutrino had a brain which had evolved in neutrino-sized ancestors, it would say that rocks really do consist of empty space. We have brains that evolved in medium-sized ancestors which couldn't walk through rocks. Really, for an animal, is whatever its brain needs it to be in order to assist its survival. And because different species live in different worlds, there will be a discomforting variety of realies. What we see of the real world is not the unvarnished world, but a model of the world, regulated and adjusted by sense data, but constructed so it's useful for dealing with the real world. The nature of the model depends on the kind of animal we are. A flying animal needs a different kind of model from a walking, climbing or swimming animal. A monkey's brain must have software capable of simulating a three-dimensional world of branches and trunks. A mole's software for constructing models of its world will be customized for underground use. A water strider's brain doesn't need 3D software at all since it lives on the surface of the pond in an Edwin Abbott flatland. I've speculated that bats may see color with their ears. The world model that a bat needs in order to navigate through three dimensions catching insects must be pretty similar to the world model that any flying bird, a day flying bird like a swallow needs to perform the same kind of tasks. The fact that the bat uses echoes in pitch darkness to input the current variables to its model while the swallow uses light is incidental. Bats, I've even suggested, use perceived hues such as red and blue as labels, internal labels, for uh, some useful aspect of echoes, perhaps the acoustic texture of surfaces, furry or smooth and so on. In the same way as swallows, or indeed we, use those perceived hues, redness and blueness, etc., to label long and short wavelengths of light. There's nothing inherent about red that makes it long wavelength. And the point is that the nature of the model is governed by how it is to be used rather than by the sensory modality involved. J.B.S. Haldane himself had something to say about animals whose world is dominated by smell. Dogs can distinguish two very similar fatty acids, 
extremely diluted, caprylic acid and caproic acid. And the only difference you see is that one has an extra pair of carbon atoms in the chain. Haldane guesses that a dog would probably be able to place the acids in the order of their molecular weights by their smells, just as a man could place a number of piano wires in the order of their lengths by means of their notes. Now, there's another fatty acid, capric acid, which is just like the other two, except that it has two more carbon atoms. A dog that had never met capric acid would perhaps have no more trouble imagining its smell than we would have trouble imagining a trumpet, say, playing one note higher than we've heard a trumpet play before. Perhaps dogs and rhinos and other smell-oriented animals smell in colour, and the argument would be exactly the same as for the bats. Middle world, the range of sizes and speeds which we have evolved to feel intuitively comfortable with, is a bit like the narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see as light of various colours. We're blind to all frequencies outside that, unless we use instruments to, to help us. Middle world is the narrow range of reality which we judge to be normal, as opposed to the queerness of the very small, the very large, and the very fast. And we could make a similar scale of improbabilities. Nothing is totally impossible. Miracles are just events that are extremely improbable. A marble statue could wave its hand at us. The atoms that make up its crystalline structure are all vibrating back and forth anyway. Because there are so many of them, and because there's no agreement among them in their preferred direction of movement, the marble, as we see it in Middle World, stays rock steady. But the atoms in the hand could all just happen to move the same way at the same time, and again and again. In this case, the hand would move and we'd see it waving at us in Middle World. The odds against it, of course, are so great that if you set out writing zeros at the time of the origin of the universe, you still would not have written enough zeros to this day. Evolution in Middle World has not equipped us to handle very improbable events. We don't live long enough. In the vastness of astronomical space and geological time, that which seems impossible in Middle World might turn out to be inevitable. One way to think about that is by counting planets. We don't know how many planets there are in the universe, but a good estimate is about 10 to the 20 or 100 billion billion. And that gives us a nice way to express our estimate of life's improbability. We can make some sort of landmark points along a spectrum of improbability, which might look like the electromagnetic spectrum we just uh, looked at. If life has arisen only once on any if, if, if life could, I mean, life could originate once per planet, could be extremely common. Or it could originate once per star, or once per galaxy, or maybe only once in the entire universe, in which case it would have to be here. And somewhere up there would be the chance that a frog would turn into a prince and similar magical things like that. If life has arisen on, on only one planet in the entire universe, that planet has to be our planet, because here we are, talking about it. And that means that if we want to avail ourselves of it, we're allowed to postulate chemical events in the origin of life which have a probability as low as one in a hundred billion billion. I don't think we shall have to avail ourselves of that because I suspect that life is quite common in the universe. And when I say quite common, it could still be so rare that no one island of life ever encounters another, which is a sad thought. <laughs>